questions. Uh, thank you again for joining um, us today. Our next webinar for AGED is going to be on Wednesday, May 10th. We have changed our monthly webinars to the second Wednesday instead of the third because of uh, scheduling conflicts. And we're gonna have a presentation on Medicare set-aside accounts, um, which have to do, if you ever work with somebody that has a personal injury settlement, uh, you need to know what a Medicare set aside means. And we have an expert that's gonna talk to us about that. So um, at AGED, we help people get on Medicaid by using our pooled trust when they're over income or asset limits. Please feel free to use us as a resource anytime and our web has a lot of really great information on it. So, um, Sarah Rodriguez has over 20 years experience in um, the elderly and long-term care arena, and she has been um, working with government benefits um, to help those people get extra benefits for quite a while also. She has a master's um, cert uh, degree and a couple certifications. I will let her talk a little bit more about that, but please... Um, Welcome. I welcome you, Sarah. And we are going to flip through the slides for Sarah um, due to some little technical difficulties, but that's fine. So take it away. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to meet with you all via Zoom. So thank you so much for being here. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the VA um, aid and attendance benefit and how to combine that with Medicaid. So um, has everybody heard of VA aid and attendance or is this new to you? Anybody? <clears throat> okay, well, it looks like we have a couple smiles. So maybe people are a little bit familiar with it. So we're going to talk about that. And just to let you know my background, I do have a master's of science in aging. Who knew that you could uh, get a graduate degree in aging, but that's me. And I have a graduate certificate as well. And I'm a certified care manager. Um, so I've been doing this for a long time and I love it. And I love the elderly. Um, I, I started out in actually in fitness. And um, I had, knew somebody who was working with the elderly and I said, this is gonna help your clients. She said, okay, but you gotta build your own, your own, you know, your own position, your own thing. And as I did that, you could see the wonderful benefits of exercise with the elderly and with people with dementia. And, uh, and then I grew and started learning about Medicaid and VA and all the benefits. So I'm really focused on quality of life and how to put benefits together in order to get the best quality of life. So if we can go to the next slide. And there we go. Um, okay, back it up. I was just gonna give people my contact that's me sarah rodriguez and you've got my contact information there you can reach out to me anytime with questions all right then go ahead and um, go forward we're going to talk about the va aid and attendance benefit first and then we'll talk about how to combine that with medicaid so one more click forward and this is an overview. So we often refer to it in the field as just aid and attendance, people will say. And it's really pension with aid and attendance. You can get aid and attendance with other benefits like DIC, but the most common one and the one I'll be talking about today is the pension with aid and attendance. It's either a, um, it's either a death pension if it's for a surviving spouse or it is a disability pension for the veteran. So the, it's benefits paid to wartime veterans with limited income. That's basically what you're looking at. It's permanent and total disability. Um, it's not you, you know, break your leg, you got to go to rehab for a little while, and then you're up and doing fine. This benefit is for those who are going to need ongoing care. 
It is the income is reduced by your medical expenses, which creates your limited income. So basically, maybe you could survive just fine on your income, but now you've got all these extra care expenses and you can't do both. You can't pay the rent and pay for all of your care. So we'll get into some more detail with that. Now, um, the medical expense of an ALF, an assisted living, if you do it right, if you do the paperwork right, that whole cost of the assisted living can be considered a medical expense. So that is a great way to be able to qualify for this benefit. So go ahead and uh, move to the next slide. When you're determining eligibility, you're looking at three areas. I think we have somebody off mute, but um, we're looking at three areas. And one is military service, two is a financial need, and three is the medical need. Next. So for the, um, the service eligibility has to be a wartime veteran with 90 days of active duty with at least one of those in a wartime. So it has to be during a designated wartime they needed to be active does not mean that they needed to be in combat or even in the location of the war. They could be stateside and still qualify. The other person is a surviving spouse of a wartime veteran. The marriage must have ended in death. So if it, it she needs to be a widow, a surviving spouse, not, I say she, because that's the most common right now, but it could very well be he. And, um, but it can't be ended in divorce. It needs to be something um, ended in death. So those are the two circumstances there and it must be honorably discharged as well. Next slide. So as far as the financial need, we say net, net worth around 100,000 or less. That's not a hard and fast rule. Medicaid has very hard and fast into a penny. The um, VA, it does depend on how much your expenses are and your life expectancy. And you can kind of look at our, the point is to kind of run out of money by the end. So if you've got, if you're young, but you're not, you've got more assets, there's an argument for being able to still qualify for that. But the other thing is in order to get the full Medicaid benefit, all of your income, your gross income, needs to be used for medical expenses, which is hard because if you're living at home, you still have other expenses. So you will have need to be using your assets or something like that for those things. Next slide. Now the medical criteria. For the VA, the applicant must be unable to perform at least two activities of daily living without assistance and they need to be permanent. So we often very simply look at um, bathing and dressing. Usually somebody who can't bathe themselves can't dress themselves either. So they're very easy to go together. Um, but medication management doesn't count. Like they may need some help with their medicines but they can do everything themselves. And this is really important when you're looking at assisted living. Sometimes somebody moves in just because they need some oversight and some medication management. Well, that's not going to meet the medical criteria for this particular benefit. So go ahead and next slide. So you need wartime service, 90 days of continuous service, be financially needy, and medically needy. Next slide. Now this is the designated war time. This is dates. So if you're wondering, you can come back to these dates of war time and say, look at the person's DD-214. That's their discharge papers. And it'll say the date that they entered and the date that they left. <coughs> And um, it's enlisted and discharged. But so if it is outside of these dates, they're not going to meet the criteria. Now, if you know anybody who was here during the Indian Wars, 
please let me know. I want to meet them. But otherwise, you can take a look at these dates and see if they meet the criteria. Next slide. Now this is the benefits themselves. So a surviving spouse. So your husband or your wife was a veteran, they had passed away and now you're needing care. That person can get up to $1,432. So that is um, the maximum benefit. Now a wartime veteran that's by themselves um, is $2,229. Now, a wartime veteran that has a spouse that's a dependent. So say dad's a veteran, but mom is not, but they are married and they're still living together. Then the maximum benefit is $2,642. Um, living together, don't get caught up on that, but it's, you know, they're still together. So these rates do change, um, usually with a cost of living increase. So each year, these amounts are gonna be a little bit different. Next slide. Now I keep saying up to, because if your income, if your medical expenses do not exceed your income, you won't get the most benefit, but you will still get some. So this example, somebody's got $4,000 a month gross income, their out-of-pocket medical expenses is $3,900, then they have a net difference of $100. So they'll get $100 less than the full benefit. Next slide. So some examples of medical expenses are an assisted living, which I mentioned earlier, a home care agency, unlicensed caregivers, or a nursing home. Next slide. So let's break that down a little bit more. So in assisted living, you want to make sure that you're looking at the total bill. Assisted living, I don't know um, if <laughs> most of you are probably know this, but it has gotten very expensive. So I mean, very easily, it can be 3,500 all the way up to almost $8,000 a month for an assisted living. Now, some assisted livings break it down. They have on their bill, um, the room and board charge, that's like your basic rent. And then they have a separate line that says level of care. And then maybe even a separate line for Medicaid management. So what you really want, because if you turn that into the VA, they're just gonna look at the level of care and that's gonna be considered your only medical expense. And it's not going to be higher than your income. So you want a bill that only shows the total and then the whole thing could be in a medical expense. And in truth, it is a medical expense because you wouldn't be living in an assisted living except for your medical need for care. So that's really important. They must be receiving um, hands-on care like bathing and dressing. And then in an assisted living, you can also combine this with Medicaid. And I'll go through a deeper example of that later, but it's one way to get the most out of both benefits and be able to afford assisted living and be able to have some spending money as well. So next slide. Home care agency. You can have somebody coming into the home providing care you can get an agency, they're licensed. They, um, if somebody's ill or can't show up, then they get somebody to replace them. But that cost is considered a medical cost as long as the doctor says that it's medically necessary. Now, um, I would love to get home care services, but I do not medically need them. So it has to be medically necessary and the bill would come in, you're gonna show that the average monthly bill is higher than the income, and that will give you the full amount. And again, Medicaid can also provide some hours in the home. So if you have the Medicaid waiver program and they said, okay, we'll give you 10 hours, but that's not really the best in the necessary enough care for you, then you could be paying for that privately and get the VA benefit that way. So 
Go ahead, next slide. Unlicensed caregivers. Often people will have family members or friends because they feel the most comfortable with them coming into their home and providing hands-on care. Now, you can do this um, if you pay them. So they need to have medical, a doctor's oversight. And the doctor says, yes, this person needs this care and this is why. And there's some forms and letters to be filled out for that. Now, one thing to think of is that this is income to the caregiver. So sometimes if you hire your daughter or somebody else to come in, it is going to affect their income taxes and those kinds of things. So take that into consideration. Um, again, it can be combined just like with an agency with Medicaid. Next slide. Um, okay, the nursing home. Now this one's a, got a, a little bit tricky, but if they've moved into a nursing home and they're paying privately, then they can get the full benefits because that is a medical expense. It's higher than their income and they'll receive the full benefits. If they go on Medicaid in the nursing home, the VA aid and attendance will drop down to $90. So not that that's bad. It, it, it's also non-countable income. So it'll be only $90, but they get to do it, spend it however they want. So that is a change um, in the combination in that way. So next slide. Medicaid. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Medicaid qualifications. So this is um, just a very basic overview of the Medicaid qualifications because this is can be a lot more complicated, but I'm really just focusing on how it combines with um, the VA. So, and we're going to, there's Medicaid that's for nursing home and assisted living. And then there's other Medicaid benefits that pay for like co-pays for the doctor, co-pay um, helps with your prescriptions and all kinds of medical expenses. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. If you're interested in that, please reach out. Um, there's a lot more information on that. So if, in order to qualify for Medicaid, technically, you need to be having assistance with four ADLs, bathing, dressing, transferring, eating or home prep, there's some different criteria there. And there are income limits. Where the VA doesn't have an income limit, you can make $5,000 a month, you could make you know, $200 a month, whatever it is, as long as the medical expenses exceed that, then you qualify for VA. Medicaid is different. They have um, an income limit. And the income limit this year is $2,742 <clears throat> for both ALF and home or a nursing home. Now, there are some things that you can do if you have that, um, if you have more income than that. And I'll briefly touch on that. But that's the income limit. There's the asset limit is also $2,000. So you can't have any more in your bank account or any other assets than the $2,000. And there's some things you can do about that too, but those are the, the simple. I'll get to that question. Sorry, I got distracted with the question. Uh, go ahead on to the next slide. Okay, VA income and Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid rule says VA aid and attendance is not considered income. So that's tricky. People will often think, oh, well, you know, those couple thousand dollars that I'm getting from the VA, that doesn't count as income at all. Well, that's not true. It, remember in the beginning, I said it's pension with aid and attendance. So the pension part is considered income and needs to go by the Medicaid income rules. And the, the, the aid and attendance part is not considered income. So you need a breakdown letter. When you get that approval letter from the VA, it just has the total amount. If you submit that to Medicaid, they're gonna count the whole thing as your income. So you'll need to go and get a breakdown letter that shows how much is pension 
and how much is aid in attendance. It's very important. Next slide. So this is the breakout breakdown this year. And again, these change every year. So for a surviving spouse, $337 is aid in attendance. So that's not counted as income. The $1,095 is counted as income. Now, as you can see with the single veteran and also with a spouse, the total income is higher if the veteran's married, but the amount of aid in attendance does, is the same. So for both of those categories, the amount is $596. So, um, that is how it's broken down. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, we're gonna go through an example. I hope you guys follow this. Um, sorry, had a little technical difficulty there for a moment, but I'm back. Okay, so Ms. Smith lives in an assisted living that accepts Medicaid waiver. The ALF charges her $3,200 per month for a shared room. She also has prescription costs and pays a caregiver to take her to church each week. Her guardian is paid a small monthly fee as well. She had some money in savings, but due to her expenses has been running at a deficit and those funds are gone. So currently she's not on any kind of benefits. She's just been paying privately out of pocket. So go to the next slide. So her income is 1209 with social security. She's getting the aid in attendance at 1432. So her total income is 2641. Mrs. Smith is not able to cover her ALF expenses and she can't pay for the companion to take her to church anymore or her guardian. So the guardian's gonna have to start working pro bono, even though she has the aid in attendance, which has been very helpful. Next slide. So if you combine it with the waiver program, she still has the social security income. Now Medicaid, when they're on approved for the waiver program will pay for her part B. It's 164.90, but I'm just rounding the numbers. So that will increase her income. And then the VA aid in attendance, you're looking at just the pension portion. So now she has $2,468 of countable income. Medicaid allows her to keep $246 if she's able. That could change a little bit, the personal allowance depending on the facility. So she's gonna pay the facility $2,222. So she's paying less to the facility, which, and she's getting more personal allowance. She gets the aid in attendance plus the personal allowance. So she has $583 a month that she can continue with the companion services, paying her guardian, and any of those co-pays for prescription costs. So just to let all that sink in, combining the two. Now, next slide. Okay. Now this one is going to be a little more complicated. Um, so just follow me um, with this thinking. Now, for, we're going to look at Dad is a veteran in need of assistance with bathing and dressing. So he meets the medical criteria. He can no longer live at home alone. So he moves into an assisted living. The cost is more than his income, but he has a small amount in savings to supplement it. The same month he moves into the facility, he gets on the Medicaid waiver program. He gets up because there is a waiting list and the waiting list um, can be up to a year long. It could, I've seen people come off of it in a couple of months, but I've also seen people be longer than a year. So, but he gets, he's like, I like this facility. I need this care. He gets on the Medicaid waiver list and he applies for the VA aid in attendance, turns in all of his paperwork, 
and a miracle happens. His name comes up right away on the Medicaid waiver and he applies and he gets approved for the Medicaid waiver. The VA aid and attendance application is still pending. For um, a few minutes later, dad receives a letter saying he is approved for aid and attendance. So what do we do? Next slide. Okay, so we're looking at, he's been living in this assisted living under Medicaid. So his income, well, first let's talk about the retroactive. So VA aid and attendance, it starts when the, the date of the application when you submit it. So it takes a while for it to process, but it'll go retroactive all the way back to the month that you submitted it. And what that means is people will get a retroactive check, a large check, and then their monthly amounts will start being direct deposited into their account. So with that retroactive, in this example, say it took them six months to get approved with the VA. Well, at $2,229, six months, now he's got $13,000, over $13,000. So what is he gonna do? He's got this lump sum. Now, if I get $13,000, I'm excited, woohoo! But if somebody's on Medicaid, that's gonna disqualify them from Medicaid. So he has a couple of choices. He can just go ahead and lose the Medicaid because he's got this money, spend it down until um, it's all gone. That's one option. If you do that option, then you would have to get go back on the waiting list and hopefully get called up again. So there's a lot of ifs and unknowns if you do that. Now you can spend down, say he's got credit card debt or his mortgage or um, somebody else was paying for something for him. So he can re reimburse all of those things or pay for those things, or if there's things that he needs, then he can pay for that. So maybe he's able to spend all that money down and it's not an issue. Another option is to put it into a pooled trust. So then he can, it's not countable assets, but he can use that money for his benefit. So he needs something while he's in the assisted living. Um, one thing in those who work in the industry will really understand is like, he gets a UTI. UTI can often make people crazy psychotic behaviors. So say the assisted living's like, we can't have him in here with these behaviors. He's got some money in a pool trust. So he uses that money to hire some caregivers. So he's got 24 supervision. The facility allows him to stay. And then once the UTI is cleared up, then he's no longer has the behaviors and you no longer have to pay for the caregivers. If he has no money set aside, then he's not able to have that option to stay where he is comfortable. So that is an example. Next slide. So there, with now that he has got the VA, he's got an income change as well. So not only do you have the retroactive check, which is considered an asset, um, he's got the change in income. So when dad was living at home, his only income was social security. He received $1,235 direct deposited into his account each month. Now that he is receiving Medicaid and VA, his income changes. Medicaid, as we talked about in the other example, pays the Part B premium. So there's an increase in that income. And this means the bank, it increased up to $1,400. Since Medicaid expenses are greater than, I mean, since his medical expenses, the assisted living is greater than his income, he re receives the full single vet amount of 2,229. So that brings his total income now to 3,620. And how does this affect his benefits? Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just extra money to have a party with. So go ahead and change slides. So if we break it down, and hopefully you can see this clearly, his share of cost for the room, the shared room, is 
$2,800. Um, this could be the room and board charge that Medicaid has contracted with the assisted living facility. So the Medicaid portion pays $1,250. Dad pays the full $1,400 but that still leaves $150 he's been, oh, you know, having to use his savings for. Now he only has $2,000 because he's on Medicaid. So he's been using that $2,000 to pay the difference. And he can't have the personal allowance of $246 because he didn't have enough money to begin with. Now, if he adds in the VA expenses, things really change. And I'm gonna walk through just these numbers and then I'll tell you how I got to them. So the room and board cost is still 2,800, but now Medicaid is only gonna pay $13 instead of 1,250. And dad is gonna pay $2,787 to the facility. And that means that the facility now breaks even. Dad does get to keep $246 of personal allowance that Medicaid allows, plus the $596 of aid in attendance. So each month he has $842 of spending money. Now that's important because if he does nothing with it, he will quickly be over $2,000 and he won't be able to have Medicaid anymore. So maybe he upgrades to a private room. He doesn't like his roommate. He wants his own space. And you can do that. You can pay privately for a private room with your, own, with your money. Or maybe he does have a pool trust and he puts whatever he doesn't spend into that pool trust and keeps himself under the $2,000. There's a couple different ways to do that. Or maybe he hires a companion. He has the money now and he can you know, have the companion take him to church or the grocery store, or the movies. Again, my focus is really on quality of life. So what you do with that hopefully will help your quality of life or their quality of life. Next slide. So the reason it changes, well, first of all, with the change of income, we talked earlier about that Medicaid has an income limit and the income limit is $2,742. So his social security is $1,400. His countable VA income, the pension portion is $1,633. So that brings his total countable income to 3,033. So he is over the income limit. So it's great that he got the VA benefit, but he needs to put it into a qualified income trust. If you don't know what that is, please reach out to me and I'll talk to you more about that. But basically any income that is over the limit has to go into the trust. You can get a trust drafted by an attorney and then you open up a separate bank account that's just for the trust. Now, if you go onto the... Um, the access portal, it does say that you do not need an attorney for a, for a QIT, for a qualified income trust. I don't feel comfortable. I help people all the time submit applications, and I always require that it's done with an attorney. Although it's not required by Medicaid, it does have to pass their legal department. So if you do it on your own, you may not know all the rules that you need to follow. So keep that in mind. Another option is to have a pooled trust that is acting as the QIT in this situation. Pooled trust can be both assets and income. And so for this situation, it would be the income. Next slide. So since the income has changed, it's increased, another thing changes. He will now have what's called the share of cost. It's not the medically needy program share of cost, it's the waiver share of cost. So breaking it down, the room and board is 2,800. Medicaid pays 1,250. And the patient responsibility was $1,550 with the personal allowance. 
So that's before VA, how everything is broken down. But if the recipient's income is higher than the patient responsibility plus the personal allowance, they will have a share cost, meaning they will pay more and Medicaid will pay less. So dad's countable income with social security and VA is $3,033. So you minus the personal allowance, minus the patient responsibility, his share of cost is $1,237. That means that Medicaid pays that much less to the facility. And so now Medicaid only pays $13 and dad pays $2,787. Okay, next slide. Oh, yeah. So, you got the QIT set up, you got the increase, you figured out what you're doing with all the spending money that dad now has. That's awesome. Unfortunately, dad declines and he has to go back into, well, not back, but he has to go into an assisted living. Now this changes things again. And the fund distribution changes again. So in a nursing home, your personal allowance is only 130. So in the assisted living, it was 246 if you had enough money, but now it's going to change to 130. And the balance of the countable income is the patient responsibility. So when he first moves in, the countable income is $3,033. Personal allowance is 130. So his patient responsibility is $2,903. Medicaid pays the remaining balance. And that's what happens when he first moves in. Now, the situation is that the VA only pays $90 when the person is on Medicaid in the nursing home, in the SNF. So what actions needs to be taken? So when he first moves in, he's already approved for Medicaid. So you're not waiting to get approval, but you need to contact the VA and let them know. So go ahead and next slide. So you would need to reach out to the VA the same month that you're admitted and notify them that, it, that it's, they've changed, the situation has changed. Um, they often, so what they're gonna do is once they're able to process that, the income is gonna change to $90 a month. And they don't usually send a letter that says, okay, you're changing to 90 you really need to watch the bank account each month because the VA, it may change the very next month or it could be months. I've even had somebody, it was almost a year before the VA changed it to $90. So everything kind of stayed the same until it dropped down to 90. The trick is though, once it drops down to 90, you need to change and let Medicaid know because now you're not getting that pension portion and they're still gonna be expecting you to pay the whole, um, to pay the patient responsibility as if you had that income. So you need to let Medicaid know that the income has changed so that they can change the patient responsibility to the facility. So it's really important to have a conversation with the facility, because as everyone knows, the government is rather slow on responding. So sometimes these processes take months at a time. So you've got to continue to have those communications. And um, yeah, so it's really important, the timing of everything, making sure that you're meeting deadlines. And, but having these two benefits work together can really increase somebody's quality of life. While, Dad say in the nursing home, you know it's going to drop down to 90, but maybe the first couple of months it doesn't. You're going to still need to have that money to where you're spending it or putting it into something that's not countable. So those are my overview. Um, I hope everyone was able to follow it. I saw some questions in the chat and I would really love to answer those and talk through any other things that came up 
as you were um, listening to these. And I, Sharon, uh, is somebody going to be able to tell me the questions in the chat or you want me just to look? We can tell you or you can look at whatever yeah. you prefer. Go if ahead you want and tell me. To read them, be okay, I can yeah. do that for you, uh, Sarah. Thank so you. Otherwise, we'll be looking. Go ahead. Valerie, the May 10th seminar is at 11 o'clock. Yes. <laughs> um, can you put your contact in the chat box? So, Sarah, make sure you do that before we leave, please. Or, uh, okay. Kate, could you do that for, for Sarah? While yeah, I can do that. Um, I did say that everybody will be getting a copy of the presentation, which also has her contact information. Right. So, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Is the $90 in the nursing home in a, that, that, you know, the aid and attendance, is that in addition to the $130 personal needs allowance when you're on Medicaid and aid and attendance? Yes, it is. So it's an addition. So basically, yeah, you get to keep both of those for your spending. It's not counted um, as income. So it's theirs to spend. Great. Yeah. Okay. And how does VA look at a spouse's income and assets? Are they counted against the VA limit? So you had said it was like $100,000 in assets. Is that for a couple or an individual or, or what? It, either way, it's around that amount. Um, if you want to, you can look at, um, I mean, arguments can be made, but again, it has to do with um, life expectancy and the um, uh, how much your medical expenses are. And it is the household income. So you're looking at both of the expenses put together and the medical expenses needed to be greater than the whole household income. Medicaid looks at it separately. So those are Often I'll say in Medicaid world or in VA world, because they have different rules. Um, so in VA, it is both. It's considered a household. Okay. And Teresa wants to know, how do we obtain a breakdown letter to be from the VA? Um, you have to have, find somebody at the VA who helps out with um, these applications and that understands what you're asking for and getting a breakdown letter. Um, that's basically what you have to do. You have to go to the VA and ask for it. A lot of times people don't know what it is, so you'll have to explain it. Or if you have somebody that you work with um, like me or somebody else, and you have to have the letter, even though um, I could write it down you know, and explain it, but Medicaid has to have the letter. They're not going to accept my word, which I wish they would, you know, but they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, uh, Tim Mati, uh, sorry if I mispronounced uh, your name. How long does the approval process take for VA? Can it be expedited? Um, you can ask for it expedited. You can ask for it. You can also do what's called, um, exact wording is escaping me, but where you say the application is already complete, that everything is there, um, and they'll look at it as a whole package. That speeds up the process. Having somebody um, help you um, that knows all the ins and outs will speed up the process. Um, but it, it takes what it takes. Um, and to be honest with COVID and everything, it has slowed down, I, you know, uh, both with Medicaid and VA, um, but there's not like a fast track, but if you have everything in order, everything that you need all put together, it's going to go a lot faster than if it's piecemeal. Right. And Sarah, that's something you can help people with. Is that correct with, you know, helping them to uh, tell them what's needed for the application, that kind of thing? Definitely. I help people all the time put all that together. And there's forms that the VA, um, I know there's some people on here that, you know, uh, work with this a lot, but like 
there's forms that the VA require and there's certain forms. It can't be a different form. And so, you know, if they're in assisted living, they need a particular form filled out that has certain information on it. There's a form where you do, um, there's like an informal claim that gets it, the process started and kind of that date and that needs to go in. And then there's also a form that your doctor needs to fill out. And sometimes the doctor doesn't um, know how to fill that out. So you gotta make sure that all the correct information is in all those forms and that you have all the doc documentation. So, um, sorry, that's a long answer to yes, I can help people <laughs> and get the, all of it submitted correctly. But if they want to go online and try to figure out, is there a spot that they can go like online and, and say, I mean, it should be, some, you know, like here's a checklist of what you need. Here's the application forms. Is there any such thing with a VA? <laughs> um, it's uh, no, I mean, a little bit. It's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah it can be a mind, mind boggling, I think. Okay, let's see. Um, can you prepay? I asked this question. Can you prepay the assisted living to spend down? Let's say you get a retroactive lump sum payment and you say, Well, I want to keep my Medicaid. Can you take that 13000 or whatever and say, I'm going to prepay the assisted living for the next three months? You can, <laughs> but then you're still going to have your income coming in. So then what are you going to do with your income if you've already paid the assisted living? Okay. So you're kind of in a catch 22, what, you know, either, you know, give it to them now and then figure out what to do with the income every month or, you know, do something different with the retroactive. Got it. Okay. All right, let's see. There's a few more questions. Uh, Cynthia wants to know, can he use a qualified income trust instead of a pooled trust? I think you answered that question. For income only, if you're over the income limit, yes. For income only, you can't use it for the assets. Um, income trust is only for income. So yes, if it, because it's over the income limit, you can use it definitely. You just for anything retroactive, or if the um, the aid and attendance and the spending money start to accumulate, then you need a, something to do with that. Now, some people have a lot of extra expenses. Maybe they have their homestead that has a mortgage and electricity and all that, and that money's just going to go. Other people, they've really narrowed it all down, and they don't they don't have any place to spend that money. So then they need to find other alternatives. Or maybe you want to set aside that money, like I said, to be able to use for emergencies like caregivers with the UTI. Um, if you're a guardian, you know, keeping that money so that you've got something to, that they can pay you with um, or other services that they might need. Maybe they want a wheelchair that isn't covered by Medicaid. They want something a little nicer um, or meets their needs better. Um, then a pull trust is really, I'll tell one other story about that. Like I had a, he was young, he didn't qualify for VA, but, um, he was in New York and he was brain injured. So he was quadriplegic and he had a, a, a wheelchair that, you know, you could move with the mouth. And so he could go all over the place. And then, um, his mom lived in Florida, so they wanted to be closer together. So moved him down here to Florida he needed to be in a skilled nursing facility. So he was already young, doesn't quite fit in the skilled nursing facility, but Medicaid in Florida only paid for a manual wheelchair. So he would get up every morning, Hoyer lifted into his manual wheelchair, sat in front of the nurse's station, wheeled to the dining hall, sat back in the nurse's station, wheeled back to his bed every night. And here's a kid who used to be able to go anywhere he wanted, when he wanted, socialize with whoever. And so his quality of life just plummeted. Um, and um, he eventually moved back to New York. But if he had had some funds set aside, he could have just gotten the wheelchair he needed or wanted. Um, of course, his basic needs are met, but his quality of life needs are not met. So there's things like that that you don't ever know that are going to come up. So, Right. Definitely. We see that with our pooled trust a lot. 
um, can, once you notify VA of the change to a uh, SNF, so you've moved into the uh, nursing home, do you need to pay that money back once they get caught up in the system or do you spend it until the change is made? Yeah, that transition can be a little bit tricky. It's true. And that's a really good question. Um, the trick is, did you notify them? So if you've notified them um, properly and it's documented, then it's on them. So you continue to spend that money. If you did not notify them, then, and they're still sending you money, then it's on you and they will make you pay that money back. So it's really important. So if they find out, you know, six months down the road, oh, you've been in a nursing home on Medicaid. Well, now you've got to pay all that money back to us and you have a debt. Okay, Marty, I, I see you shaking your head. So I think that answered your question. Great. It's a good question. Sarah's information there um, is in the uh, uh, chat now, info at benefitsofaging.com with her phone number. And Ralph wants to know, oh, Ralph has piped in and given us VA form 20-10207 is for priority processing requests. Good tip there, Ralph, thank you. Um, will the ALF keep dad without payment knowing eventually that they will get paid once approval comes through? Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, well, that really depends on the ALF. Not many will, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you've got somebody who's, you know, has, um, is willing to take that risk. The problem is if dad passes away before the approval comes, VA doesn't pay. So now the facility has a debt. So not many of them are really willing to take that on. So there are some companies out there that kind of do a loan while you're going through that process or people put it on a credit card or those kinds of things, but the ALF is not assuming the risk in that case. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I believe it would. Um, okay, we're almost out of time, but there's one more question or uh, the Pinellas County Veterans Services Department can file and give you all the forms for free. They are wonderful. Well, that is good to know. That's good. It's always good to have a, a um, contact. There is. You can go directly to the VA and, and do it all for free and they'll give you all the forms. Most definitely. I do, you know, recommend I'm just here to help and others are here to help to navigate that too. Right, great. Well, Sarah, this has been very educational. I know I've learned quite a bit today and everybody again, will be getting um, uh, your presentation. It will also be posted to our website under our trainings. All of our past trainings are posted there You know, from the last couple of years. And I thank you very much again for um, uh, uh, giving, uh, presenting today. We really appreciate it. And everybody, thank you. Um, please, uh, any questions, feel free to call Sarah or Agent, and we can try to help put you in touch with the proper resource. So thank you once again and have a wonderful rest of the day.